and welcome to day two of our Power BI course. Today, we're mostly going to be focusing on data modeling. Data modeling is the process by which we take data from many different sources and combine it into one data model. That's not to say that each piece of data is actually combined with other pieces of data. What it really means is that there is a meaningful link created between the different sets of data. So in this little visual on the left-hand side, we have all of our different jumbled sorts of, of uh, different kind of original sets of data. And on the right-hand side is a very structured organization of how we're going to uh, lay this data out. We're going to create a connection between all this data that is going to stem eventually down into one large transactions table, which would be the trunk of the tree in this analogy. And then we'll be able to still get all the information from all these different sources, um, but we don't have to combine them and smash them all into one table to do that. This feature is generally referred to as data modeling. If you're in Excel, depending on the version of Excel that you're in, it might be referred to as either Power Pivot or Data Model. If you're in Power BI, then it's going to be referred to as modeling. And among the modes on the left-hand side, you'll be able to see the most obvious view of modeling going to the relationships mode on the left-hand side in Power BI. By the end of the day, we're going to take all this data that we have compiled in all these different sources, and we're going to be able to put it all together. So we've already created some reports. But we want to take data from a bunch of additional sources and create even more reports. Once we have all of these reports, then we're going to need to put them together in one comprehensive overview of the company. This comprehensive overview of the company is what we refer to as a dashboard. And you'll see an example on the right hand side of this slide here. A dashboard is an overhead view of all the different metrics and analyses that somebody might use to analyze the company. Now, when we create this dashboard though, it might be a little bit difficult to send this dashboard to the people that are really gonna need to use it and analyze it. And so what Microsoft has done is created an online service for Power BI, which makes it so much easier than sharing a file. Previously, you might expect that a dashboard would need to be shared by actually sending a file to somebody, meaning emailing the file. This introduces all kinds of problems. First of all, you worry about duplication of the file. Um, you worry about different people making different modifications, and then you don't actually have the original. Somebody else has made modifications, and there are 60 different versions out there somewhere. So we want to avoid that. Secondarily, a lot of these dashboards are actually going to contain massive amounts of data, and so it's not really possible to send the file to somebody. So Microsoft has created an online platform from which you can easily share your dashboard to anybody. You could either send them a dashboard that looks like the one that you see on the upper right hand side. This one is actually being viewed inside the Power BI features, the Power BI online features in your Office Online account. Or you can easily embed your dashboards inside of a SharePoint page or a regular web page or something like that to allow somebody to be able to see it. People can then look at that data on their phones, on their regular computers, different teams of people can see it at the same time. And then of course you yourself can uh, see it as an individual and make modifications whenever necessary. Our goals today when it comes to the actual data that we're going to be dealing with, we have a lot of different data that we're going to pull today. Our objectives are going to be to analyze our sales and profits and returns over time but we don't actually have totaled sales information. We don't have any profits information and we don't have any returns information in our data set. What we have is information about the um, individual pieces of a transaction. So how many products were sold in this transaction? What date did, did it happen on? Uh, what was that product's um, original cost, right? So our, the cost of the goods sold, how many of the items we sold, um, what our... Um, what our standard retail price is for that item. So we have all of that metadata for the items. And from that, we're going to need to derive sales, profits, and returns, meaning. We're then going to need to see this analysis segmented by the different products and the product subcategories and the product categories that we have. So we have a little bit of a hierarchy of meaning there. Um, and we're going to need to segment it by each different uh, layer in the hierarchy. Then, of course, we're going to need to visualize this. 
Now, of course, we could visualize this in a pivot table or in many, many different pivot tables, um, but we're also going to be utilizing the power of Power BI in order to analyze a bunch of different kinds of analyses in the same setting. And then we're going to be able to very easily share this analysis in a consumable dashboard. So that's our agenda today. It's usually at this point in the course when I get questions about what the difference is between querying and data modeling. Why not do all of your work in query? Why not do all of your work in data modeling? So we're gonna take a second here just to segment the meaning between those two. Power Query, which is what we spent all day yesterday talking about, doesn't actually store any of the data. And that's one of the really cool things about it. It borrows the data's source and then provides a temporary view for you so that you can make certain kinds of changes. And then when you actually click on close and load, that's when it actually loads it into a spreadsheet. But Power Query all by itself doesn't actually do any uh, data holding or data handling. Power Pivot, on the other hand, actually stores the data and massive amounts of it. This is the real data model storage medium. It compresses the data extremely well and allows for mobility and analysis of that massive data. It is often compared to SAS, S-S-A-S, which is SQL Server Analysis Services. It is a SQL engine for Excel or for Power BI, wherever you use it. What's interesting is that it operates from the end user side. So you and I can use the Power Pivot features very easily, whereas if somebody needed to get information from a SQL Server or something like that, there's usually a small team of people that are actually given access to that. So let's get to know this powerful data modeling tool. Yesterday, we got all of our data. Now that we've gotten the data, now we wanna start uh, building upon that, that querying of all of the data. You do need to be able to normalize that data, which is in the center blue block there. You do need to normalize your data before it gets into Power Pivot, because unless it's normalized, you're gonna have a really hard time actually modeling that data. But once you get it all normalized and it's all ready, then you can go ahead and put it into Power Pivot. Power Pivot is where we are gonna be able to relate the data, create custom analyses and measures on that data. And this is where we really start to determine correlations and outliers between our measures and between our sets of data. When it comes to Power Pivot, it is one of the bigger portions of learning that you'll need to do in Power BI, or if you're gonna operate in Excel, this is where you're going to need to spend a lot of your time learning for the future of Excel. Now, it used to be that we had a common path of knowledge in Excel. This is still the case generally. Most people start off by entering data and then performing some basic formulas and functions, creating and using cell references, sorting and filtering data, and then they'll start visualizing it in charts, and then they'll create some pivot tables, create some advanced functions, and then they'll start to import data, play with some arrays, and then finally we get to the world of macros. This might sound a lot like your pathway. There might be a couple pieces missing, but it's, it's most people's pathways through Excel. In much the same vein, there is a common pathway in learning Power Pivot. So we're learning Power Pivot, also known as data modeling, and we're gonna start off by taking a look at just your regular pivot table. So when we are creating these pivots in Excel, what does the actual just general pivot table look like? And then we're gonna to need to start to create relationships between our data in order to do some more interesting analysis among our many different sources of data. We'll need to calculate uh, columns of extra data based on our original data. Uh, so that's gonna be how we're gonna get sales, returns, and profits information which is the three main categories of analysis that we're gonna to do today. And then we're gonna create some simple measures based on that data. So maybe it's something as simple as, I just wanna get a total of all the profit, or it might be something as interesting as, what is the change of this profit over the same period from last year? That is not the type of analysis that a pivot table can do for you. So you will need to get into the world of power pivot or modeling, uh, which again is the same thing, Depending on the program that you're using, it is called something different, but they are the same thing, power pivot and data modeling. And then we'll want to be able to start to do some much more interesting analysis, including creating complicated relationships, 
understanding uh, measure evaluation and being able to ma manipulate that knowingly, using filter and all to do those manipulations, using some X to basically auto insert row context where there isn't already row context. You'll get a lot more familiar with these terms as we go throughout the course. What we're gonna be covering today is everything that is in blue here. So we're gonna start by looking at some pivots, talk about relationships, create calculated columns to create some extra metadata, create simple measures on those columns. And we're also going to get a nice introduction to the calculate function, which is probably gonna be the most important DAX function you'll ever learn. Now that we know how to grab our raw data, put it into Power Query, and we're starting to talk about Power Pivot, let's take a look at the normal data pathway through Power BI. So we start with raw data, and then we pass all of that data through Power Query in order to normalize it and manage it. And then once we have normalized it, we can now land it in Power Pivot where we can do all of the interesting data modeling. After we have done that, of course, we can actually use Power BI to create some of those really nice looking visuals, and that is our pathway. Let's start by opening a completely blank Excel file. The first half of this course, or I guess it's about a third of this course, is gonna be all about how to use the data modeling or power pivot features that are within Excel. And then of course, we're gonna move over to Power BI and see it act exactly the same over in Power BI. So in order to get started, we're gonna to need to actually see Power Pivot. But by default, Power Pivot isn't actually turned on. In Excel 2016, it does already belong here and it's already in the program. I just need to turn it on. On the data tab of the ribbon in Excel 2016, over on the right hand side, I'll have a button that says manage data model. If I click on this, I'll get a message that says, uh, that asks me whether I would like to enable the data analysis add-ins to use this feature. If this is the very first time that I've used it, I'm gonna get this message. But once I click enable, I shouldn't get that message anymore. You'll see a window pop up and it will look a lot like our Power Query window. It's a mostly gray window and we only have about four tabs of the ribbon up here. This is Power Pivot. And you'll see that even though 2016 refers to it as Manage Data Model, it actually also refers to it as Power Pivot. So Power Pivot is what its name is once you actually open the feature, but the tool itself in Excel, the button says Manage Data Model. So keep in mind, data modeling and Power Pivot are the same thing. I'm gonna hold them side by side so that you can see the two different windows here. On the left-hand side, I have Power Pivot, and on the right-hand side, I have Regular Excel. Now, I did this through Excel 2016, so it's good to know if you have a previous version of Excel exactly how you might open this. So just in case you do, I'll run through a quick little walkthrough of how we would manage that. In Excel 2013, you do have it, but you're gonna need to go turn it on. It is among the many add-ins that you have for Excel 2013. And so you can go to File and Options and select your add-ins. Now, once you get to your add-ins menu at the bottom, you'll wanna to go to where it says manage down here and it says Excel add-ins from the get-go, but you'll wanna click on that and choose COM add-ins and click go. From there, you will see a uh, power pivot for Excel 2013 and you should be able to click on that box and then click okay. And once you do that, um, you should see your power pivot tab of the ribbon. If you have Excel 2010, you can still have it. It just isn't already in your program, even like it was in Excel 2013 where it was back there, but it wasn't turned on. In 2010, you're gonna need to go download it. So you'll wanna go and look for the Microsoft download of Power Pivot for Excel 2010. Either way, once you get it and you turn it on, you will have a new tab of the ribbon that says Power Pivot. Now, there are a couple of things that you can do inside your Power Pivot tab in Excel. First of all, you can click on the button that says Manage, and that will pop up your Power Pivot for Excel window. You can also create measures and KPIs directly from over here. You can take data that already exists in this, in this Excel spreadsheet and actually add it to your data model. You can update your data, detect relationships, and play with a couple of settings there. We're gonna spend most of our time in uh, the first hour or so of our session directly within the Power Pivot window. So I'm gonna go ahead and expand this window here. Now, so far it looks pretty boring and that's because I don't actually have any data in here. 
I'm going to need to retrieve data from a few different sources, including the great geography file that we worked all day yesterday creating. Come on back in the next video and we'll talk about getting data. In this course, we're going to be retrieving information from a couple of different sources. We're going to start by retrieving information from our massive source, from our database. It just so turns out that our database is actually in access. On the Home tab in your Power Pivot window, you'll see a command group called Get External Data. Within that command group, you'll see a command called From Database. Go ahead and click on that. Let's just take a moment to uh, observe the different kinds of databases that we can easily retrieve information from, a SQL Server, from Access, or even from another Power Pivot file. We have all of our data inside Access, so please select the option that says From Access. And then you're going to need to browse for your file. Find your folder called Student Files. Inside there, there's another folder called Student Files. And inside there, you should see day two work files. Inside there, we have a file called Contoso Data. This is all the data that we're going to be using. Contoso is a fictional company created by Microsoft. We did talk about this during the introduction, but they sell a lot of retail products. I'm going to go ahead and click on that and click on open. And next. Now we have a lot of data and a lot of different tables in that particular access file. So I'm gonna to wanna to select from a list of tables to make sure I only get the tables that I need and I don't take the ones I don't need. You could also write a query that will specify the data that you would like to import if you know how to do that. I'm gonna start with the very first option here and go ahead and click next. These are all the different tables that are in our access file. We're gonna to wanna to be able to import information about all the different channels that we sell in Maybe we don't need entities yet because we're not really looking at all of our different uh, entities. We're also going to import from our fact sales table. Our fact sales table is going to be the big data set. This is the history of all the transactions that we've ever had as a company. With that fact sales table, on that table, we don't really have very many labels for things. We have IDs in each transaction. So each transaction has the date that it happened, and then it has a product ID, a product category ID, a product subcategory ID, a promotion ID, a channel ID, an entity ID, a geographical ID, and probably a store's ID as well. So there are a lot of IDs in there. Now, each one of the IDs actually links out to one of these other tables here. So we're going to start by grabbing the fact sales table, but we're going to grab all the different tables of metadata that we might later want to be able to analyze, like by uh, product information, or by a more generalized product category. Or uh, halfway in between product category and products, we would have a product subcategory as well. So we'll take a look at this as well. And then later on, we might want to be able to analyze our promotion. So we're going to select all these tables except for the table called entity. And before we move on, we're going to want to make sure that we don't take every single little bit of data in every table if we don't need it. For instance, in our product category table, our company has eight product categories because we have recently decided to launch two extra product lines. However, we haven't actually had any sales in those product lines yet because it just got launched. So we're going to want to take that out of our analysis so it doesn't take up extra space. I'm going to click on product category table and then click on preview and filter. This is going to allow me to actually filter out information that I don't need. And let's say, for instance, games and toys and home appliances are the two particular product categories that we're not going to need. So I'm going to go ahead and filter those out. Games and toys I don't need. And home appliances I don't need either. And I'll go ahead and click OK. I should have product categories 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 there. And so long as you have 1 through 6, you can go ahead and click OK. If I wanted to do more filtering, you can absolutely go in here and do that, but I'm not going to do that. Let's just move on and actually get to the fun stuff. I'm going to go ahead and click on Finish here, and now I can watch it work. As we've said, Power Pivot is a mass data management program. Uh, a SQL engine for Excel, which means that it can handle massive amounts of data. As you know, or as you may know, Excel only actually has 
48,576 rows in it these days, and that's in modern Excel. But as you can see, this program is having no problem importing 2.2 million records from our fact sales table alone. I'll go ahead and click on close. And now we should be able to see some tables here. So we have some information from Access. Now Access is a great database management tool. It also allows us to create relationships between the different tables. In Access, if somebody has actually created relationships, you can see those by going into Diagram View here in Power Pivot. Because both of them are Microsoft products, Access does a really good job of translating the relationships between the tables. And so Power Pivot does a really good job of picking up those relationships. So you'll see that each one of these tables that we just imported also imported each one of the relationships. Okay, that's pretty cool, but let's go back to data view because we still have some more data that we need to import. Because Power Pivot is a mass data management sister program for Excel, it means that it might crash every so often. If you're in 2016, you probably won't have this happen as much, but in the previous versions, it crashed a little bit more often. It also is going to depend on the processing power of your computer. So I just want to get back to the good old fashioned 90s days and save and save often. So we're going to go ahead and save our file right now. I'm going to go ahead and click on save and we are going to call this data model. I'm going to save this file as data model and you'll notice that it actually changed the name of the Excel file. So even though it seemed like Power Pivot was a separate program, Power Pivot is actually part of an Excel file. If I wanted to send this data model to somebody, all I have to do is send the Excel file to somebody and they'll also get all of the Power Pivot data model. All right, let's get back into Power Pivot. We're going to need to import a little bit more information here. This isn't quite enough. It's pretty good, but we're going to need to also be able to analyze geographical information. And we're going to want to analyze some stores information. Now, it just so happens that our stores information and geography information isn't in that access file. It's maintained in other types of files. So we'll need to import that. In Power Pivot, on the home tab of the ribbon, in your get external data command group, you'll want to find the command called from other sources. You have quite a few other sources that you can choose from. Scrolling down, you'll be able to see all different kinds of database sources, multi-dimensional sources, data feeds, and text files. We're going to choose an Excel file because that's where our stores data is. I'll go ahead and click on Excel file and click on next. Now I'm going to want to be really careful here. This is one of the few little, it's not, it's not a bug, but it kind of feels like a bug sometimes. This box does not check itself. However, most of the data that I contain in Excel does tend to have headers. If I don't check this box and my data does have headers, I'm actually going to have to redo this whole thing from scratch. Now I am telling you that as of March, 2017. So that could change in any of the updates coming up and hopefully it does. But in the meantime, we're just going to want to be really mindful of it. We're going to click on browse to go find our file. Here's our file called stores, which should be in student files, student files, day two work files. And you should have stores right there. And we'll go ahead and click open. Now I'm going to go ahead and check on this checkbox because I know that my data does have headers. And I'll click on next. That took no time at all. I'll click on finish. And close. Now, finally, we're going to do one more exercise in Excel. We just imported data that was put in by either a data dump system or an actual human is in charge of maintaining that particular file, which means that the whole thing is data entry. However, we have another kind of an Excel file that we created yesterday, a file that was entirely created through query. Let's go ahead and get that file as well. We're going to do the exact same starting process. We're going to choose from other sources. And we're going to find our Excel file. Click Next. You want to browse for your file called Geography. Now there is one in Day 2 Work Files. I would prefer that you choose this file called Geography in Day 2 Work Files because that just ensures that everything is going to be perfect. Go ahead and click on Open. 
make sure to click on the box that says use first row as column headers because we do have headers in our data. And we'll click on next. Now this file has a lot of tables. This file has a lot of tables because there were a lot of queries issued. And the original creator, when they created a lot of these queries, they did load them to the spreadsheet. And so you'll see a lot of data. So if you are doing this, <clears throat> like we did yesterday, you'll want to make sure to be very explicit about where what your completed file looks like. Here, you'll see there is a sheet called completed. I made that as a note to us to know that that was the finalized data. So I'm going to go ahead and check on that and only that. I don't need all of the data that contributed to it because I do have a finalized completed sheet. And I'll click on finish. And click on close. Now, as great as this is, that sheet called completed, six months from now, I'm not going to know what completed meant. I'm going to look at this and be like, what's completed, right? So the first thing I want to do is make sure to rename all of my tables here so that they explicitly refer to the type of data. You'll find that it's really common that when you import data from Excel, unless you went in and actually named a table in Excel, that data won't always come in to power pivot with a very explicit name. So you want to get into the habit here of renaming all of your table tabs to make sure that they explicitly refer to the data contained inside. We now have over 2 million records that are stored in our Power Pivot data model. So of course, we're going to want to make sure to save again. Remember, save and save often. And then how about we actually start taking a look at some of this data that we've imported? One of the many benefits of pulling all this different information into Power Pivot is that we can see information from many different tables in many different sources in one pivot table. Historically, you could only create a pivot table from one original table of data, and that table of data had to be located in Excel. However, with Power Pivot, now we can create a Power Pivot from our data model. So depending on the version of Excel that you're in, you can actually initiate a pivot table from a couple of different ways. And we're going to want to do that right now. If you are in Excel 2010, 2013, or 2016, you can issue a brand new pivot table using the pivot table command inside of Power Pivot itself. This is the most obvious and straightforward way to create a power pivot table. And a power pivot table is the only pivot table that can analyze data from your data model. Brand new in 2016, we also have a feature where we can create pivot tables from Excel that actually use our data model. So in Excel, on our insert tab of the ribbon, on the left hand side, normally you'll see a pivot table button. I've made my screen a little bit narrow so that's why I have a tables drop down instead. But right there is pivot table. And when I click on that, there's this brand new edition that says use this workbooks data model. So if you're in Excel 2016, you can just use this method to create a power pivot table as well. Now I could say that I want it to be in a new worksheet or an existing worksheet. Let's say I know exactly where I want it to go. And that's right here in cell B2. I'll go ahead and click OK. And now we can play with our very first pivot table. Power pivot tables look a little bit different. In your field list on the right hand side, instead of seeing a list of fields there, you'll see a list of tables. And inside each table, if you click on the little triangle on the left hand side, you'll be able to expand it to see all of the different fields inside that particular table. Let's say, for instance, we wanted to analyze how many regions are in each continent. For this, I might want to go to my geography table. In my geography table, I'll probably take my continents, or rather my continent name, which happens to be at the bottom of the list, and I'll drag it and I'll drop it in my rows field area. That'll give me the name of the three different continents that we have. Now I can take our region column, and I can click and drag this into our values field area. This is going to count the number of regions that we have in each continent. Looks like we have 113 in Asia, 220 in Europe, and 338 in North America. Let's get a nice, comfortable breakdown of how to build a pivot table. 
Of all the different types of fields that you might have in a given table, it's important to recognize the difference between two different categories. You might have data that is categorical in nature, or you might have data that is calculable in nature. Now, we have already talked about this, but the general difference is that categorical data has a particular label or item that repeats itself more than once. It doesn't have to repeat itself more than once, um, but generally that's what you tend to see. You also tend to see words here more often, although it doesn't have to be words. Think of a categorical field as a field that you might want to analyze the storyline of. Okay, so you might take something like Asia or Europe or North America and analyze something about it, like in this case, the count of the regions. In this case, what that means is that our continent field is categorical. Categorical fields do really well in rows and columns. Now, because of the nature of people, we prefer to see long lists rather than wide lists, and so by far, rows is actually a preferred location for your categorical data. And occasionally, you'll want to segment out your, your row data by some columns, in which case you might put something in the columns, but most people lean on the rows for their categorical information. Values, on the other hand, is where all of your calculable data goes. So in this case, what we wanted to do is take the region field and count the number of regions that were in each continent. And so we put this field in the values field area. However, if you think about it, regions are a text field. And so any kind of a field that is a text field, when put in the values field area, automatically reverts to count. Now, this isn't so much the case if you take a numerical field and put it into your values field area. Let's say, for instance, we wanted to get our projected revenue information. I'm gonna take out the count of region and I'm gonna get our projected revenue information and I'm gonna drop it in the values field area. Now, the automatic function that was applied to this field was sum. That's because this is a naturally calculable field of data. Okay, this is pretty good. However, maybe we want to know the sales quantity among all of the continents that we have here. Now, when we do this, we are going to run into a problem. It's a good learning experience, though. My sales quantity is going to be located in my fact sales table. From here on out, if we're looking for any information about revenue, about sales, about profits, about returns, about sales quantity, anything like that, all of that data is going to be located within your fact sales table. If I expand the fact sales table, I might grab something like our sales quantity, and I'll drag that and drop that into values. But I'm going to see a huge problem here, and that is that I'm seeing the total every single time. The reason for this is that there is no relationship between these two tables. Remember, this came from the geography table, whereas this data on the right-hand side came from the fact sales table. The fact sales table we pulled in from Access, so it pulled in all the relationships of all the other tables around it. However, the geography table we pulled from an Excel file, and so this did not pull in any relationships. In order to create relationships between our tables that don't already exist, we're going to need to return to our actual data model. And remember, our data model is Power Pivot. So I'm going to need to move back to my Power Pivot window. Now, in my Power Pivot window, the default view of all of your data is in this view that we've been looking at where we have the tables at the bottom and the data preview is showing up up here and it's columned information. This is called data view. However, if you wanted to see the relationship between all of the tables that you have, there's another view called Diagram View. If you click on Diagram View, now we'll be able to see all the relationships that were established between our tables. We'll also be able to see any relationships that don't exist. Later on, we're going to realize that our fact sales table is the biggest table. And it also happens to be the trunk of our tree of all of our different data. When we very first started today's session, 
we took a look at this tree analogy on this slide here. All of the different sources would be all the information that is located in the branches, but the trunk of the tree would be the data model itself. And it just so happens that one of the tables from our access file is the very large transaction table called fact sales. In order to think about this properly while I'm doing all of my work, I like to move all of my tables around so that they actually exemplify that tree analogy that we saw. So you'll see that when we move these tables around that the relationships stay maintained. If you hover over the relationships, you'll see the fields that are connected. So I'll hover over this one and I'll see promotion key in the promotion table connects to promotion key in the fact sales table. I'll also see that there's a one on one end and then there is a asterisk, which is meant to mean many. So in this case, we have a one to many relationship here. And you'll find this is generally how the flow of information goes. You'll have a very large transaction table, such as our fact sales table here. And then you'll have many different tables that are stemming off of it, like the branches of a tree. In order to get started, like I said, I like to move my tables around so that they actually appear like branches of a tree. This will help me when, as I continue to do data modeling later on. The other thing that we need to do is actually notice our tables that are not yet connected to our data model. Now, just to be sure, you'll want to click on this little icon down here. What this is going to do is it's going to expand your view so that you can see all the tables. Occasionally, you will have imported a table and it will show up way over here on the right-hand side and you can't even see it, so you'll want to use the zoom feature to be able to see it. So if we look at our data here, we can actually see that there is a correlation between our data. In our stores table, we have a store key here, and that connects directly to our fact sales table and a store key that's located over here. If I wanna actually create a relationship between this data, all I have to do is click and drag one field and drop it on top of the other. Now be careful, make sure that you're dropping it on top of the correct field, and I'll drop it, and there we go. I have a relationship. I'm gonna create one more that goes from stores to geography so I can connect the geography table. Geography key matches to geography key, so I will click and drag and drop. If you haven't done so already, go ahead and pause the video and take a moment to connect your store key to store key from the fact sales table to the stores table. And then to connect the stores table to the geography table, you'll want to create a relationship between geography key and geography key. Now that we've created these relationships, our pivot table should be adjusted. And look, there it goes, looks perfect. Great, so we're able to do this analysis for sales quantity. But what if I wanted to do an analysis of the sales amount? The sales quantity is just the quantity of products that we sold. And then I also have information for the standard retail price of each item that we sold. It would be nice if I could combine those two pieces of information together to create sales amount. We actually have a couple of pieces of missing information in here that we're gonna have to generate. And in order to do this, we're gonna need to create calculated columns. Let's return to Power Pivot and switch to your data view. And switch to your fact sales table as well. So we're in data view and we're on our fact sales table. Now, just a moment ago, we were analyzing the sales quantity. But let's say we wanted to analyze the sales quantity times the MSRP, the manufacturer's standard retail price. That would be the price that we actually sell most of the products at unless we discount them. But let's just assume for now that we don't discount them. So if we wanted to get the actual sale amount, we're gonna have to multiply the MSRP times the sales quantity. Lucky for us, in Power Pivot, we can generate extra data based on existing data. So if I have MSRP and I have sales quantity, I can use this area all the way over on the right-hand side in Power Pivot to add what's called a calculated column. 
So I'm going to create our very first formula in here. You'll want to do this with me. I'm going to select the very first box right here. Now there's a reason I did not call that a cell. The reason that I did that is because Power Pivot does not care what row that is. I know it looks like there's a row assignment there, but it actually doesn't care. Power Pivot doesn't care. Furthermore, Power Pivot doesn't care that this has a particular column ID. Actually, there is no column ID. They just have names, right? So we don't see any column A, B, C, D, E, F. Furthermore, let's appreciate one more thing. Let's say maybe I got the discount quantity wrong here. Uh, if I want to change that, watch what happens when I try and type. Okay, there is no data modification back here in Power Pivot. The reason is that Power Pivot is a data modeling feature. It is not for data entry. All right, if you want to do any kind of data entry, you'll want to do that in the original data set. This is just the place where we take all of the information and analyze it all at the exact same time. So you'll notice you actually have no power over a single cell or a single value in Power Pivot ever. All you have power over is entire columns at the same time. So that's why I called this a box and not a cell. By entering anything into this box, essentially I am entering it into every single other row in this column as well. So let's start by putting in a formula to multiply MSRP times sales quantity. I'm going to start with my equal sign. If this were Excel, I just typed in my equal sign, I should be able to see it right there, but this is not Excel and I don't. I will, however, see it in the formula bar. So from here on out, you will want to keep your eyes out for the formula bar. This will be the place that you focus on for your calculations. So make sure that you've selected that cell and started with your equal sign. And then we're going to ask to take the column called MSRP and in Power Pivot, I can just click on it and you'll see that it injects it into my formula. Much like in Excel, when you click on a cell, it injects that into your formula. I just injected the whole column. And I'm going to multiply that by our sales quantity. Now there is a slight difference from what you're used to in Excel. There is a specific syntax for listing a column. You do need to surround that with your square brackets. In the occasion that you actually have a space in your column name, you're also going to need to surround that with your apostrophes. And you'll see examples of that later on in the course. All right, so make sure that you've typed in this formula here or that you have selected on the columns to inject the references and go ahead and hit your return key. Power Pivot might take a second to think about it, but remember, it has to do it more than 2 million times. And that actually looks pretty good. Now, I know all the numbers look the same right now, but that's only because I'm looking at the very top of my list. If I scan down a little bit, you'll see that all of my numbers start to vary. All right, so it looks like that worked. The first thing I'm going to want to do is make sure that I rename this column here, because calculated column 1 is not going to be a very good name for me. I'm going to rename this sales amount. If you haven't done so already, please make sure that you've created an added column on the right hand side. It should have the number 6990 at the top because you have put in an equation that multiplies MSRP times the sales quantity. And then do make sure that you have named it sales amount. Go ahead and pause the video if you need to and then come on back. We have two more calculated columns that we're going to want to create because we have two more types of data that we want to analyze. We want to be able to analyze the cost of goods sold and the return amount. The reason we need this is because sales amount and cost of goods sold and return amount is all needed in order to later on calculate profit. All right, so let's start with our cost of goods sold. Our cost of goods sold is going to be the unit cost times the sales quantity. So here's our sales quantity, and then we also have the unit cost. That was the cost to us originally to procure that unit. So we'll take the unit cost times the sales quantity, and that should give us the cost of goods sold. So we're going to create another formula in here that takes into account the unit cost times the sales quantity. And then you'll want to name this column cost of goods sold. If you haven't done so already, please make sure that you have put in the field called cost of goods sold using this calculation here. 
And finally, we will want to create another column that calculates the return amount. Now we don't have the return amount in here, but we do have the MSRP that we sold it for. And then how many units, if any, were returned. So we're gonna create a calculation over here that takes into account MSRP times the return quantity. And we'll call this return amount. If you haven't done so already, make sure to pause the video and ensure that you also have your return amount column in there. All right, we have created three derived columns of information based on data that is elsewhere in the table. Let's see if we could create a calculation based on the calculations we just made, a calculation based on a calculation. All right, we're gonna create another column here that's going to figure out profit. Now our profit is calculated by taking our sales amount, subtracting the cost to us originally, the cost of goods sold, and then of course, subtracting any returns that we had, any return amount. Please make sure to name this column profit amount. And finally, let's say we wanted to know how much our sales compared to the profit was. All right, if we wanted to figure out that, we would need to take our profit and put it over the sales amount. So we would start with an equal sign and say we wanna put our profit over the sales amount using our division sign. Now this would be called a profit margin. And this data technically should be considered a percent. And so I'm gonna select this column I'm gonna select this column and we're gonna format it as a percent. That looks pretty good. If you haven't done so already, please pause the video now and make sure that you have five derived columns here. We should have sales amount, cost of goods sold, return amount, profit amount, and profit margin. And then come on back and we'll keep going. Now that we've made these great sets of metadata here, let's go ahead and use them in some analyses in our pivot table. Let's return to Excel. In Excel, we built this basic analysis of our different continents and then the sum of the sales quantity. But now that we have some more meaningful information like sales amount, let's go ahead and put that in instead. I'm gonna take out sum of sales quantity and I'm gonna go into our fact sales table and find those columns of data that we just generated, sales amount, cost of goods sold, return amount, profit amount, and profit margin. I'm gonna grab sales amount and drop it in the values. That is pretty neat. Now, sum of sales amount, that's a lot to read. So if I wanna make this prettier, I can double click on the header there, double click where it says sum of sales amount, and I can change this to just say, sales amount. And now it that's kind of a nicer reflection. It helps my end users. All right, good with sales amount. Let's take a look at something else. I'm gonna take out sales amount and let's say we wanna look at all of our profit amounts. So I'm gonna grab profit again and put it in values. Well, that looks pretty good too. And I could do the same thing and rename it if I wanted to. And if I change my mind again and then say I need to analyze sales amount one more time, I'm gonna grab sales amount and drop it in the values. But all of a sudden it says sum of sales amount. It says that again. So does this mean I'm gonna to need to remove the sum of before the name of this field every single time? The answer is yes. Because the word sum of is Excel notifying you that it's actually placed a measure on this field of data. Let's talk about what a measure is. You've been using measures for a really long time, you just didn't know it. It's just because you didn't know the terminology. A measure is the mathematical method by which we take a bunch of numbers and distill them down into a single value. For instance, this is the sum of the sales amount for Asia. And here is the sum of the sales amount for everything. If I were to go back into my original data in PowerPivot, it's worth discussing 
how I might take all of these separate numbers, these numbers that appear many, many, many times. We have 2.2 million numbers in this column alone. So how do we take all of these different numbers and collapse them into a single number in one space? That is what we call aggregation, taking a bunch of numbers and summarizing them by means of some kind of mathematical storyline. You could take all of these numbers and add them all up together. That would give you a great storyline. And that's what we have here in our pivot table here. We have a sum adding them all up together. But you could also choose a different type of function to create a different storyline, like count or average. Average will take all the same numbers, and you know how an average is calculated, but it will take a lot of numbers and distill them down into a single value and tell a story. In this case, the story that it's telling is, this is the average sale amount for all of our continents altogether. Other types of aggregations that we can use are max and min, standard deviation, and standard deviation for a population, variance and variance for a population, and we now have a brand new function called distinct count, which is very cool as well. However, those are the only measures that are designed and, and provided by your standard pivot table. So it's important to know how you can actually create your own measures. The ones that are provided by, by a pivot table are what we refer to as implicit measures because they are implicitly provided by the pivot table. However, if you wanted to explicitly say, this is exactly how I want this field calculated, you're gonna create your own custom explicit measures. Let's go ahead and create our very first measure. If you go to the Power Pivot tab in the ribbon of Excel, you'll see a command over on the left-hand side that says measures. We're gonna create our own very basic measure here and we're gonna start off with something simple like just, just a sum of the sales. So we're gonna go to the measures dropdown and choose to create a brand new measure. Now in general, when you're starting off, you wanna store all of your measures on your transaction table. Our big massive transaction table is currently called fact sales. So we'll go ahead and store it on our fact sales table. And unless I otherwise specify, we're gonna be using fact sales as our primary table for measure storage. The measure name for this, since we don't wanna call it sum of sales, right? That's a little boring. Let's call it uh, something very obvious like total sales. Okay, I'm gonna skip down until the place down here where I can design the formula. Now, the formula for a total sales is just a sum, just like you would design it in Excel. And it's a sum of our uh, column called sales amount, which is actually on the fact sales table. And you'll see here in this little drop down menu, it seems that Power Pivot really wants you to explicitly mention not only the column that you're gonna be using, but also the table as well. So I am going to uh, just start by typing in uh, sales amount here. And as I start to type in sales amount, I start to get some, get some really neat suggestions here, including the one that actually explicitly mentions the table called fact sales and the column that we created called sales amount. I'm gonna double click on this and that's gonna inject it into my sum formula here. Now it takes a little bit of getting used to, to look at this, but in no time at all, you'll start to look at this as though it were one field of information. Now, of course I did open up my parentheses for the sum function. I'm gonna need to close it on the other end. And then I'm just gonna take a quick moment to specify how this data should be formatted. Uh, this is currency, so I'm gonna click on currency and it is gonna need the dollar symbol. Two decimal places is good. All right, I'm all good. I'm gonna click okay. All right, so now we have our total sales measure in our table. The nice thing is that unlike these implicit measures that we were using earlier, no matter how many times I remove it or put it back in, it's always gonna be called total sales. And lucky for me, it's always gonna use the exact same function. One of the other things that you might've noticed previously is when you're putting certain fields into your values field area, it always comes in as the sum. So let's say you had a particular function uh, like your profit margin, that's actually supposed to be an average type of a calculation. So in that case, you usually want to use the average function on it, but you'll have to go and do that every single time manually unless you create your own measure. All right, 
Speaking of which, let's keep going. Before I move on, please make sure that you've created a measure called total sales. You can ensure that you've made that measure by clicking on your measures drop down menu and selecting manage measures. Then you'll be able to see a list of all the different measures that you have. So far, we just have the one called total sales and I'll click on edit so that I can open it up and actually see how this thing is built. Please make sure that you have designed at least this one before we continue. So if we have made a measure based on sum, I'll bet it follows logically for you that we could create some easy other measures that use average or max or min or count or standard deviation or variance, any of those things that you've already seen in the pivot table. However, there are a lot more functions that you can use as well. This function, the one that we're looking at is called sum. You've been looking at this in Excel for a very long time. However, this technically is what's called a DAX function. This function is actually coming from PowerPivot. There's a collection of functions that PowerPivot uses in order to be able to perform operations on an entire field of data at the same time. If you think about it so far in Excel, you've always created operations based on cell to cell interactions. But now we're actually creating operations on entire columns, entire fields at the same time. So for that, we need to create a whole new breed of functions and that breed is called DAX functions. DAX stands for uh, DAX, Data Analysis Expressions. Um, and they are the language by which we perform functions in PowerPivot. The exact same functions that you can use in PowerPivot will be available in Power BI in the data modeling feature as well. Let's go ahead and get used to some new ones. Let's start with a function that finds all of the transactions that happened in Asia. So all of the sales transactions that happened that were connected to the Asia continent. So we're going to create a brand new measure here. Okay, the table name, it needs to be on the fact sales table. And we're going to be counting the transactions here. So I'm going to call this total transactions. The formula that you can use to count all the transactions that happened in a particular table is called count rows. Now, the nice thing about the count rows function is that it doesn't actually need to know what column you're looking in. Because if you think about it, you're going to have the same number of rows in every single column in your table. So all I need to do is specify a table. So I'm going to say, look at my fact sales. This is my list of all the transactions that happened for us. So look at my fact sales and count all the rows. Now, uh, in this case, we'll say it's a number. Um, I don't expect to have any decimal places here. They should all be whole numbers. So I can go to the format and choose a whole number. And then I can also choose to use a thousandths separator if I think that I will need it and I'll click okay. Okay, looks like we had 458 thousand transactions in Asia. So this is pretty cool. We know how many transactions that we actually had, but let's say we wanted to do something a little bit more interesting. Let's say we wanted to know how many days we were actually selling, right? Now we're a global company. So each location is probably going to have had a uh, transaction, I don't know, maybe four or five, six, maybe even seven days out of the week. But altogether, with all of our stores combined, it's really likely that our whole company combined is going to have a transaction, at least one transaction for every day of the calendar that we've had so far. Uh, however, maybe if we want to get down and deep in the stores analysis, we actually want to look at the stores and how many different days that they were selling. So let's go ahead and create a measure for this. We can analyze it by continent and then we can actually step into store detail and actually see this exact same analysis for stores as well. So we're gonna create a new measure here and it's gonna be located on the fact sales table. And we're gonna call it days selling. We're going to use a function that counts the number of days, but only counts the distinct days. And that function is called distinct count. Now, it just so happens that in our fact sales table, 
we do have a date key column. And in that date key column is the actual dates that every transaction happened. So if I am trying to analyze all the, all the distinct days, then I am going to uh, use that particular field. I'll close out my parens here. And uh, it is going to be a number, should be a whole number, and I'll use my thousand separators and click OK. So it looks like each one of our locations sold exactly 1,095 days. It just so happens that we only have records for the last three years or so. And so, of course, every single um, continent has had at least one transaction every single day that we've been in business. However, if instead of just looking at continents, maybe we wanted to look at store information. Store information might be a little bit different because each location might not actually sell seven days of every week. So let's go ahead and look for our stores table. And maybe I'll look for each store name and I'll grab store name and I'll drag it and drop it underneath the continent name in the rows. And now you'll see that we have certain stores. Uh, this store, Contoso Bangkok no uh, number one store, only sold 523 out of the last however many days we've been in business. Okay, so this is a very different kind of analysis here, but still very meaningful. Okay, let's create something even more interesting. Let's say we want to be able to evaluate the strength of each one of our stores by the total sales that they have per transaction. We want to know which stores have the highest sales per transaction, meaning when they do some, sell something, it's usually a high sale number. Okay, we're going to need to create a new measure for this. Here's our new measure located on the fact sales table. And we'll call it average sales per transaction. And we're going to calculate this by taking our total sales, the measure that we've already created, our total sales measure, and dividing it over our total transactions, another measure that we've already created. Okay, this is probably going to be a currency figure here. So I'll use the dollar and it'll have two decimal placeholders and I'll go ahead and click OK. All right, now we're seeing a lot of different numbers. Let's see if we can sort this by the highest number. I'll right click on average sales per transaction. I'll right click on that and go to sort and I'll say I wanna sort largest to smallest. And it looks like at least within Asia, our Contoso Asia online store has the largest sales per transaction. Very well done. That was our session on measures. I do have a lab for you. Let's see if we can create a couple of more measures here. We've already created the very first measure here, total sales per transaction, or rather we changed that into average sales per transaction. Let's go ahead and make a couple more measures and you're gonna do this on your own. You're gonna to wanna to make a measure that is sales per day or average sales per day. And you also wanna make one that is average transactions per day's selling. So when we are selling, how many times are we selling per day? All right, go ahead and give that a shot and come on back. These measures that we just created are really good and we're gonna need them later on. Uh, for now, we are gonna create some additional measures as well that are gonna use the calculate function, probably the most important DAX function you'll ever learn to use. In order to do this, let's go ahead and keep this pivot table since we're gonna need it later on. And let's go ahead and create a brand new sheet in Excel. And on this sheet, we'll create and insert a brand new pivot table from our data model. Remember, if you're using a previous version of Excel, you'll actually need to go back to Power Pivot and then click on the Pivot Table button from over there in order to create a Power Pivot Table. Okay, now let's say that we're analyzing our sales. Okay, so we're gonna go to Fact Sales and maybe we want our uh, sales amount here. And we want to be able to analyze these exact same sales. And maybe we want to analyze these sales by the continents again. So we'll go down to geography and find our continent name. Now it turns out that each one of these continents run different kinds of promotions. 
Now, it's not that you would know this already. I just know it because I'm rather familiar with the data. But if we go back into Power Pivot and actually look at the data, if we go to the promotion table, you'll see that we have a lot of different kinds of promotions. We have, uh, first of all, the promotion label number one is no discount. So if something, if there's no promotion on something, it's marked as promotion key one over here. Okay, but all the other promotions refer to an actual promotion that we've had. And we have some in North America, spring promotion, back to sales and holiday. We have some in Asia, holiday, spring and summer, European ones, North American ones, uh, some more Asia, Asia holidays. Here we have Asia holiday promotion, Asia spring promotion. And they each have their own discount percent. So so sometimes when these transactions take place, there is a promotion applied to that particular discount. Now, it's important for us to start to be able to analyze regular sales versus promotion sales. So we'll need to go into our measures and be able to create that. However, the measures that we've created so far really don't have an ability to filter. And that's what we're going to need. We're going to need to filter our total sales by just the items that adhere to one of these promotions. For instance, if we wanted to be able to figure out what our total sales were for things that were that were not on discount at all, we're going to need to be able to take into account the total sales, but only for items that were associated with promotion key number one. Typically, we would consider this a filtering process. And as far as we know, measures don't have an ability to do this. But that's why the calculate function is probably the most important function that you will ever learn in DAX. Let's go back to our pivot table that we just created and create a measure using our calculate function. Because the calculate function, what it does is it applies filters. So we're going to go to Power Pivot tab in Excel. Go to our measures drop down and create a new measure. Of course, this measure does need to be on the fact sales table. And we're going to start off by creating a total sales amount for things that are not on promotion. We'll call this regular sales. Now, when it comes to actually creating the DAX function for this, the magical function that we're going to use and the one that is going to be so important to you is called calculate. Think of calculate like a sum if function in Excel, if you've already used that. What a calculate function does is it allows you to have two different pieces to it. The first piece is just the regular old function calculation that you're going to be doing. For instance, for us, that would be a sum of our sales amount, right? Think of your calculate like a sum if function in Excel. The calculate function allows us to do two different things. First of all, its first argument is to just go ahead and perform the normal arithmetic of a normal measure. Now, a normal measure would do something like sum up the total sales. And we've already created some measures that did that. So we would sum up the total sales as the very first argument of calculate. The second argument of calculate, this is where you actually put in your filter. So in this case, you might say, okay, go ahead and do this arithmetic if the criteria in a specific column equals something specific. And therein lies your filter. So only add it up if the promotion key was one, which as we know is no promotion. Now, just so it turns out that the calculate is super flexible, meaning if you wanted to put your um, pieces of your measure in here. So if you wanted to put your sum function and then what your sum function was supposed to add up our total sales in here, you could absolutely do that. However, if you have already created a measure that did that, like we did, we now have a measure called total sales. Instead, you can use a calculate function that just includes an entire measure that you've already designed as the first argument. That way you don't have to copy things a bunch of times. All right, let's go ahead and create it. All right, we're going to start off with the name of the function, which is calculate. In this case, we're going to use our normal total sales measure, which we've already created. So I'm just going to go ahead and type in total sales. And there's my total sales measure. I'll just inject that into my calculate function. And that's going to be the first argument. 
The second argument is what I want it to actually um, consider valid to add up. In this case, it's sales that are not on any promotion at all. And as we know, any items that are associated with the promotion key one don't have any promotion on them at all. So we're going to say, all right, on the fact sales table, we actually have a promotion key there. You could also do this by accessing the promotion table instead. That would be fine. You can go ahead and do that. I'm going to look for the fact sales table where we have the promotion key. And there it is right there. And in the circumstances that promotion key equals one, then I want it to calculate. Okay. So this is going to be a currency figure because it is total sales. And I'll go ahead and click OK. And let's see what it looks like. Wow, isn't that interesting? It's such a small portion. All right. Let's see what the inverse is. Let's see if we can create a calculate measure that figures out anything that is on promotion. So we'll say any promotion key besides one. Those are things that are all on promo. So we'll create one new measure on our fact sales table. And these are promo sales. And we're going to use the calculate function to calculate our total sales if the fact sales promotion key if it's anything besides one then it's on some promotion okay that's going to be a currency as well and we'll go ahead and click okay that looks pretty good I'm just going to test it to be sure. If this thing is correct, then regular sales plus promotion sales should equal all my total sales. And the sum says 1818049281151. That matches right there. So I know that it's working. If you haven't done so already, make sure that you create those two calculate functions that we just made. One for regular sales and one for promo sales. And then come on back and we'll keep going. Very well done. It's time for a lab now. So what we're going to do is we're going to take into account every single type of measure that we have created so far. We are this time going to analyze some return information. So we're going to start by analyzing uh, our returns just by doing a basic sum of the returns measure. And then uh, we are going to get net sales by taking total sales and subtracting the total returns. After that, we're going to figure out what percent of all the sales get returned. Uh, so in, at that point, we're going to take into account the total returns and divide it over the total sales that we have so that we know overall how many of the actual transactions that we have um, get returned. Or actually, this isn't transactions. How much of the actual sale amount uh, gets returned? What percentage of that? After that, we're going to use the calculate function to figure out exactly how many transactions get returned. And finally, we're going to take the total transactions that were re returned and divide it over the total transactions that we had altogether. By the time you create this last measure, your results should look like the picture above on the upper right hand side. Now keep into account when you um, calculate this particular percent, it's not going to look anything like these percentages here. So wait until you get to the very last measure here and then go ahead and check your results by seeing, uh, by comparing them against the picture here. All right, give it a shot. Good luck. Well done. If we take the last few measures that we created in that lab and we try to put them in a pivot, this is generally what it should look like. These are the last few measures that we created with that lab. Now, if we wanted to be able to visualize these, of course, we're going to run into a problem because a pivot chart is only going to be able to um, display uh, part of this analysis. So, of course, if we want to be able to look at each one of these measures that we've just created and create some uh, good looking visuals to display the analysis here, we're going to need to pull this into Power BI where we can do that uh, nice and comfortably all on one page in a report. 
So how do we do that? How do we take a bunch of uh, data modeling that we've done in Excel and pull it into Power BI? The first thing that you're going to want to do is make sure to uh, save your file. I saved it as data model. And for me, it is located in uh, the student files folder, which I happen to have placed on my desktop. Uh, so inside student files, uh, there I have uh, date, the data model file. All right, so uh, I'm going to go ahead and save this and I'm going to close out of it. And we're going to open up Power BI. Once in Power BI, we're going to need to import a data model from Excel. This isn't going to uh, require the method through which we're used to importing data from Excel. Uh, this is the way that we import uh, data that's actually populated in an Excel worksheet, but this just populates the data that is uh, in cells and rows and columns within an Excel worksheet. So if we want to pull in some data that's actually in an Excel data model, that's going to require a very uh, slightly different process. We're going to need to go to File, go down to Import, and we're going to import Excel workbook contents. If we do this, we will be able to pull in the entire data model that we've designed inside Power Pivot in Excel. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna go into our student files folder and in here is my data model file and I'll go ahead and click on open. You'll get this little notice that says we don't work directly with Excel workbooks. We know how to extract the useful content so we can work with it in Power BI desktop. Um, they're saying that a new Power BI file will be made. Okay, and it is going to take a couple minutes. I'll click on start and wait for it to do that. Okay, looks good. We got all of the queries that we uh, created. Um, we actually issued these queries from Power Pivot, though. They're just uh, the ways that we got data. Go ahead and click on close. And now you'll see on the right hand side, we have all the same tables that we had in Excel. Furthermore, if I go into our fact sales table, we can scan down and you'll see, uh, if you look really close, we have a bunch of measures here. You can tell that they're measures because there's a little calculator icon right next to it. Um, so here are a bunch of the measures that we just made. Go ahead and pause the video and make sure that you have imported the entire data model from Excel. In order to do this, go to File, Import, and choose to import Excel workbook contents. And then you're going to want to import the workbook contents from uh, the file that we created called data model. Once you're done, come on back and we'll keep going. Now that we have all the data that we need in Power BI, it's important to talk about how we could do the same things that we've already done in Excel directly within Power BI. The method we've gone in this particular course is to design the entire data model inside of Excel, but it's really important to know that you do not have to do that. You can design the data model directly within Power BI. The only reason that some people build it in Excel first is because they need to be able to present the data both in Excel and in Power BI. Seeing as how it's so easy to bring the data into Power BI, but it's not so easy to get a data model in Power BI and bring it into Excel, it tends to be a preferred method for people who need to report both in Excel and in Power BI to actually create the data model in Excel and then just bring it into Power BI like we've done. Seeing as how we just brought the data in here, let's take a look at a couple of, of examples of how we might do the exact same things that we've already done in Excel, but we'll do them directly in Power BI. If you wanted to build your entire data model inside of Power BI, you could simply come into Power BI, go to get data like we've already done and look for all of your data um, inside here, right? Uh, if you wanted to find that access file, you could go down to more and you'll see that your access database option is right there. You could then import the other couple of files from Excel and then you would need to just create the relationships by simply going to relationships mode here in Power BI and then you would just click and drag on the fields exactly like we did within Excel. The other thing that we need to do in Power BI that we talked about how to do in Excel is create calculated columns and measures. So if you switch to data mode, you can take a look at each of your tables and maybe you wanted to create an extra column over here. You'll notice it doesn't look exactly like Power Pivot, uh, but up on your 
Home tab of the ribbon, on the upper right hand side, you'll see a calculations command group. Looks like there's only one thing in there that says new measure, but if you click on it, you'll see that there's also an option to create a new column. We're not going to do that, but it's just as easy as doing it in Power Pivot. And as it turns out, it's also just as easy to create a new measure just by simply clicking on the new measure option there. Now, if you want to do this from the ribbon, that's totally fine, but you'll find as you get used to Power BI that it gets a little bit hard to remember to click on your table first and then click on this every single time. And if you don't, sometimes you'll accidentally end up putting that calculated column or that measure in a different table accidentally. So the way that I've come to get used to creating columns and measures is to right click on your table. If you right click on your table, you have the option to create a new measure or a new column. Now let's go ahead and create a new measure here because we'll notice that it actually operates a little bit differently than Power BI. Now let's actually go ahead and create a new measure here because we'll find that it operates just a little bit differently than the way we're used to doing it in Power Pivot. I'm going to go ahead and click on new measure. The main difference when it comes to creating measures in Power BI is that you don't get that great new measure dialog box. So you're going to need to be able to create your measures right here in the formula bar. The other thing to remember is that the name of the measure goes before the equal sign. So you're going to type in the name of the measure here, and then you're going to give a space and then an equal sign and then another space. Power BI likes some of the spaces at the beginning of the naming conventions. And then you'll go ahead and put in your uh, measure here. So we're going to do a little lab here, and our lab is going to be to analyze our profits. So far, we've analyzed our sales and we have analyzed our returns, but we haven't analyzed our profits yet. So we're going to create a couple of basic measures that we already know how to create in Power Pivot, but this time we're going to create it in Power BI instead. Let's do the first one together, and then you can work on the other three on your own. The first one is just creating a total profit measure. So in this case, I have already created my new measure and I'm going to rename it total profit followed by a space and equal sign and another space. And then I'll just create the rest of the function here, which is a sum function. And I'm going to sum up the fact sales profit amount here. All right, when I'm done, I can go ahead and click on enter. And I've now created my measure. If I scan down, I'll see total profit among the list of the other measures that I've already created. All right, now it's your turn. You're going to create three more measures. Again, I do recommend right clicking on the table called fact sales and choosing new measure from there. That'll ensure that you're always creating the measure on the correct table. And then go ahead and program the rest of these measures here. You'll want to pause the video right now and then come on back when you're done. Now that we've created these great measures, let's go ahead and use them. So what I've done is I've used a couple of the measures that we created. The first two ones that we created were total profit and total profit margin. I just threw those into a couple of card visuals. So I just grabbed our measures, tossed them onto the canvas, and then uh, my total profit margin, of course, it wasn't coming up as a percent. So you are going to need to click on total profit margin and then make sure that you format it. You will need to do that on the modeling tab of the ribbon in Power BI. Once you do that though, every single time you want to pull this data in, it's always going to be formatted as a percentage, which is pretty cool. The second thing that I did is I created a little visual over here on the left hand side, and you can do this with me if you would like. I created a donut chart that used the two other measures that we created, regular profit, and promo profit. I'm going to go ahead and click on this visual so that you can see how I've applied each of the fields in the values well. The other thing that I did to get this nice looking data label over here is I modified the data labels. So I went over here into format and then I went down into detail labels and originally it just said category but I chose both under the, the uh, label style there. So I chose both. Now I get to see the category and the numerical value there. So this is pretty cool. And if I were to hand this over to a decision maker, they would easily be able to see uh, what the profit is. But this is just the profit for overall. So maybe I want to be able to allow them to uh, choose 
certain segments of our data. Maybe I want them to be able to choose certain product categories and see what the profit margin, the total profit is for that and the regular profit compared to the promo profit. If I want them to be able to slice the data, I'm gonna create a slicer. So I am going to uh, choose a slicer from my visualizations pane over here. There's my slicer visual. And let's say for the first example, we would like them to be able to slice by product category. So I'm gonna come over into my product category table and choose product category name. I'm gonna to have to expand this a little bit to see that. Product category name, there we go. Now my end user can choose audio, cameras, cell phones, computers. They can slice by all these different categories in here. And I could continue making some more interesting slicers as well. Maybe I would make a slicer for product subcategories. I could create a slicer for continents. I also probably would want to make a slicer for maybe uh, different promotions that we were offering or stores that we were selling, but I definitely want to be able to create a slicer and slice the data for time, for a particular time period. I want to look at this data for 2016, and then I also want to be able to look at this data for 2015 and see how our profits have been changing over time. Unfortunately, we can't really do that with the existing data that we have in Power BI because we do not have an entire table of dates. We often refer to this as a calendar table. Now I do have date data in my fact sales table. I have a date key column. And if we switch over to data mode, we'll see that the uh, date key column right here uh, shows all the dates in which these transactions happened. But if I try and use that date key to uh, put into a slicer, uh, let's try it with a slicer for instance. Put a date key in a slicer. First of all, that looks a little bit weird, and it tries segmenting it out by all this information. Let's try putting it in a visual. Okay, so I'll grab my date key and I'll put it in a visual. Now it's trying to uh, put the information on the axis, and again, it is confused about this information, right? So what I'm going to need to do is create a date table in Power BI. Even if that date key worked in some of my visuals and some of the slicers, because sometimes it does. Power BI can be rather clever about it sometimes. But even if it did work, the problem is that I don't have a consecutive set of time periods. Uh, ideally, we would have a consecutive set of days of the entire time that we've been in business. And only with a consecutive set of days can I actually do calculations that determine difference over time and interesting things like that. So we're going to want to create a date table so that we can analyze over time. Here are some good recommendations for how calendar tables should be designed. There needs to be at least one column of the date data type, meaning as you start to generate data for your calendar table, it won't necessarily presume that you have dates in there. So you'll wanna definitely format at least one column as an actual date data type. You'll also want to contain exactly one row per day. Meaning, you have a row for every single day in the time period since the beginning of business. And it has to be completely consecutive, meaning no gaps. Don't skip weekends even if you're closed. Again, exactly one row per day and no gaps. It also needs to be related to your data tables. Otherwise, it won't actually work. It turns out that our data table is the fact sales table. Our fact sales table, we've been referring to it so far as a transactions table, but it's also really commonly referred to as a data table, typically because it has the most data of any of the other tables. Your calendar table also needs to contain columns for all of your desired groupings. So all of the kind of uh, data you're gonna wanna analyze it by needs to be populated in extra columns in your date table. So uh, if you want to be able to analyze by months, you'll need a column for months. If you want to be able to analyze by quarters, you'll want a column for quarters. If you want to be able to analyze by fiscal quarter, 
you'll need a column for a fiscal quarter. So just be mindful of the kind of analyses that you're going to want to be able to do in the future, and then make sure to create that metadata when you create your calendar table. And finally, ideally, it only spans the dates of your data. So the very first day you went into business, maybe you didn't have any sales for two months after that. You want it to start on the day that you had your very first sale, unless you were supposed to be selling from the very first day of business, in which case you might want to make some adjustments and that's going to be up to you. There are two primary functions that you're going to want to know about in order to create calendar tables. You have a calendar auto function and then just a regular calendar function. The calendar auto function requires no arguments because what it does is it goes in and it looks at all of your data and it figures out what the very first date data type you had in your data. And it considers that the beginning of your calendar. And then it goes and looks for the latest date data type and then considers that the end of your calendar. This is all fine and good, uh, and it works really well, so long as you don't have any dates that precede your first day of business. For instance, in our data set, we have all kinds of information like load dates, and those load dates are actually preceding our first day of business. So the calendar auto function won't work very well within our data set. And so we'll need to use the function that allows us a little bit more control over the start and end dates of our calendar table, and that is the calendar function. With this function, we get to choose the start date and we get to choose the end date. Now you may know that Excel doesn't think about dates like we think about dates. In Excel, when we put in dates such as uh, today's date, this is my date today, it's being displayed conveniently for my purposes as month, day, and year. And it even looks like that in the formula bar. But it turns out that that's not the actual data that's behind the scenes there. The actual data that's behind the scenes, I can see if I change the formatting into general. And the date there is going to be 42799, which is the serial number for this particular date. A long time ago, Microsoft decided uh, that they would allow us to be able to add and subtract days together to determine differences in periods of time. And in order to do this, they had to put time on a linear scale. So they had to create a beginning of Excel time. And the beginning of Excel time is January 1st, 1900. Every day since then, Excel adds one, meaning today is day 42,799 since January 1st, 1900. All that means is that each day in the history of Excel does have a serial number associated with it. So all this means for us is that our calendar function is not going to want the regular start date and end date as we would populate it. It's actually going to want the start and end date serial numbers. So unless you can memorize the serial numbers for your start date and for your end date, which if you can, great. But if you can't, then we're going to use a little helper function there's a little helper function that we can use called date. And this one is particularly cool because it allows us to just type in the year, the month, and then the day of our data. And with that information, it will then convert this into a serial number and feed it into our start date. So that'll be convenient for us. All right, so it basically looks like this. All right, so let's go ahead and create our calendar table. I'm gonna start by going to the modeling tab in Power BI, and I'm gonna click on this button that says new table. I love this button. It's a lot easier to create a new table from a function in Power BI than it is in Excel. So this is particularly handy. I'm gonna start off my table with a function here. And I'm gonna name that table dates. And I'm gonna use my calendar function. Now I know that my data starts on uh, January 1st, 2014, but I have no idea what the serial number is for that. So I'm gonna use the date function to help me figure out the serial number. All right, here we go. This one just needs the year, the month, and the day. So that is 2014, January 1st. And then it will convert this into the serial number, which is what the calendar function wants. Great. All right, I'm going to put my comma in there. 
And now I'm going to put in the end date, which again, I have no idea what the serial number is. So I'm going to use the date function to figure that out for me. I happen to know that our data ends on December 31st, 2016. So here we go. 2016, December 31st. All right, so that's the second argument of my calendar function. I just have to close out my calendar function and I'll hit enter. Let's go into data mode to actually see this in action. All right, looks pretty good. So I'm gonna follow the directions that I suggested exactly to a T. So I'm gonna start by selecting my very first column here that is called date. Um, and I'm going to rename it date key. I'm gonna name it something very specific, date key. And then I'm also going to format this. Now the formatting right now is one of our date time formats and it's actually what in Excel we would consider the long date format or I'm sorry, the date and time format, but I just want it to be my regular dates. I don't need the time in there. So I'm gonna go into date and time and actually choose the short date format as we would commonly see it in Excel. Okay, so I'm being very careful about the formatting of my dates. All right, let's take a look at our checklist. We do have at least one column of our date data type contains exactly one row per day. We know that because our calendar function did that. And it is completely consecutive with no gaps. Now it needs to be related to our data table. Ah, so let's take a second to go ahead and do that. Our date keys here can relate to our fact sales table, but we're gonna have to do that manually. So let's go ahead and find our relationships mode. Click on relationships mode. And then I'm gonna take my dates table over here, take our date key column, and I'm gonna click and drag this to relate it to the date key column in fact sales table. Drop it. Every once in a while, I get this error. If you're getting this error, no worries. We're just gonna do it backwards. I'm just gonna select the date key column from the fact sales table, click and drag it and drop it on the date key in the dates table. All right, that worked great. Our last task here is to contain columns for all of our desired groupings, like month. So let's go ahead and create some metadata in our calendar table. In order to do this and to see it visually, let's switch back to data mode. Now we only have one column of data, so we're gonna wanna make a bunch of metadata in this table. All right, let's start with something very easy. Let's start with a column that's just gonna populate the years. That will allow us to eventually be able to select our year column and then be able to an do analyses over each year. So we could compare each year to each other. I'm gonna go to the modeling tab in Power BI, click on the button called new column. And I'm gonna create a new column here that's based off of our date key. So I'm gonna go up into the formula bar and I'm gonna name it at the same time that I create it. So I'm gonna name it year, and year is created by using the year function. The year function only needs a date as an input. So I'm gonna say, great, okay, we have our dates table, and then we have our date key column here, and that's what I want you to extract the year from. Looks good. Let's create another column. How about we look at months? So we've used a year function. Let's see what the month function does. Create a new column. We're gonna call this month, and we're actually gonna use the month function. All right, once again, I'm using my dates tables date key column, and from that, Power BI is gonna extract the month. Now notice that it's only extracting the month numbers. Hmm, that's not exactly what I wanted. I did want the month names. Okay, well, we're gonna do that in just a second, but I'm gonna take just one moment to rename this. Clearly, it's not the month I'm gonna be using most often, the month label. So I'm gonna rename this to month number or month num. Later on, that's gonna help me. Okay. 
So that's all well and good, and we're actually going to need the month number later on. But let's go ahead and create a new column and see if we can't get month names in here. There's a great function in Power BI that allows you to look at any number and then extract a certain piece of information and convert that into text. There is a function in Excel that does that as well. The function is actually called text, but here in Power BI, it has more to do with how you're formatting dates. And so the function over here is called format. This time we're looking for month name. So I'm going to go ahead and type month name. And I'm going to use the format function. Now the format function just needs a date as an input. So I'm going to use my dates, date key, and then I'll put a comma in there. And the second argument of the format function is how I want the month to appear. So in this case, I want the month to be fully spelled out. In that case, I'm going to put in four M's surrounded by quotation marks. That's going to provide the fully spelled out month name. However, if I did three M's, you'll see that creates an abbreviated month name. I'm just going to copy my formula up here, create a new column, paste my formula, but I do have to change it. So I'm going to say month name uh, abbreviated, ABR, and I'll take out one of those M's. All right, so now. However I choose to populate my date information in there, I'll be able to use both the fully spelled out month name and the abbreviated month name. All right, that's pretty good so far. The rest of this exercise is going to be a lab. Go ahead and create the rest of this date table here. You're going to need the following metadata. You've already created year and the month number. Month number two would say, 01 for January. We didn't actually do that in this example, but you can do it if you'd like. We did create the fully spelled out months and we did create the abbreviated months. Now you want the day of the month's number, the actual day's name as in Monday or Tuesday, the day name abbreviated, the weekday number, so which number of the week a particular day is, the quarter number, the quarter name, which we're going to use a concatenate function for, the month and the year, and then the year and the month. These different kinds of combinations are used for all kinds of different things in Power BI. Now, of course, remember, this is just an example of metadata that you might want in a calendar table. You're going to be using all of this metadata for this particular course, but when you create your own calendar tables in real life, you might not need all this data, and there might be data that you need that's not in here either. So keep that in mind. And with that, go ahead and give it a shot. Well done. This looks pretty good. Before we move on, let's remember to save our file. I'm going to go and click on my save button and oh my goodness, we have not even saved it yet. I'm going to name this data model and click on save. Now that we've created all of this great metadata in our dates table, let's go ahead and enjoy some of the fruits of our labor here. I'm going to switch back to report mode and we're going to create an analysis that actually analyzes profit by year. So I'm going to start off by grabbing my profit measure, which is in my fact sales table. We called it total profit and I'll click and drag total profit and place it on the canvas. Now I want to segment this by year. So let's go back to our dates table that we've just created and we'll choose year and we'll drag it and drop it as well. Notice that Power BI is considering year a calculable field, and that's because it's a numerical field. But in our case, we never want to calculate year. So we want to take this out of the values. And we also want to tell Power BI in the future, never summarize year. Year is supposed to be non-calculable. So I'm going to select on this field. I'm going to select on year. And we're going to go in, into the properties command group in Power BI in the modeling tab of the ribbon and find the feature that says default summarization. Currently it's set to sum like all other numerical fields. The default summarization is sum, but I can click on that and say, hey, don't summarize it. 
In this case, if I drag and drop year onto my visual now, you'll see that it actually segments it by year, which is exactly what I wanted. And this is because I told Power BI not to summarize my data here. Looks pretty good. All right, let's have a little bit more fun. We have an analysis for year over here. Let's say we wanna create another analysis for months. What I'm gonna do is copy and paste this particular visual. Copy, paste, using my Control C and Control V keyboard shortcuts. Otherwise, you can also go to your Home tab and use your Copy and Paste features up there in the ribbon. Now, this particular visual over here, I'm not analyzing years, so I'm gonna take that out. In this case, I'm analyzing months. I'm gonna grab the month name and drag and drop it in the axis area. Or of course, I can always just drag and drop month name onto the visual itself. Now the default sorting order that's happening over here is greatest to smallest. So I'm gonna wanna reverse this so it actually puts it into month order, right? So we're gonna change this. We're gonna click on the ellipsis and say, we want to sort by month name. However, when we sort by month name, you'll see that it's sorting in reverse alphabetical. Even if I click on this again and choose sort by month name so I get my forwards alphabetical, it's starting with A because it doesn't understand the order of months. So I'm gonna need to go back and change this in my data. Let's switch back to data mode. And on your dates table, what you're gonna do is you're gonna choose the column called month name. On the modeling tab of the ribbon, there's a command here that says sort by column. So I can choose to sort the month name column by another column. And we do have a column called month number here. So I'm gonna choose month number. Okay, that should have fixed it. Let's go back to our visual. I'm gonna go back into report mode and let's see if it did it in the right order. January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November. That looks pretty good. All right, now there's one more thing that I wanna deal with because these are actually the totals for all of the months in my data. And I know that I have three years of data. So how do I start to segment out the difference between uh, January 2014 and January 2015 and January 2016. The way that we're going to start to do that is we're not going to have two separate visuals for months and years. That starts to get a little bit hectic to look at. So I'm actually going to remove this visual that we have for months and I'm going to take the visual for years. And we're going to make it a little bit more interesting. So now that I've selected this visual and I have the year in the axis field, what I'm gonna do is actually add the month name into the axis field as well. So I'm grabbing month name and I'm gonna drag it and drop it underneath axis. So now in the axis well, I should have year and then month name. Now at first it doesn't look like anything happened, but a few new buttons have actually showed up on my visual. You'll notice three new ones on the left and one new one on the right hand side. Let's start with the ones on the left. The ones on the left allow me to drill down into my data. If I hover over the double arrow, it says go to the next level in the hierarchy. What it means is that I've actually started to develop a hierarchy over here. Okay, if I drill down the next level, now I can actually see all the months. And again, that is not the correct order, so I'm gonna correct Power BI. All right, and now I shouldn't have to do it anymore. If I wanna drill back up, I can click on my up arrow there. And then I also have the ability to drill or expand all down one level in the hierarchy. Check this out. If we click on that, it shows me the year and then the month. And I get to see it for the entire history of our operations. Drilling back up all the way to the top, let's check out what this button does over here. This actually activates something called drill down mode. If you click on this, it enables somebody to be able to choose one of these columns here and then drill down into just the months in this particular year. So clicking on 2016 will expand all the months for 2016. If you had additional fields in your hierarchy, they can then click on one of these months and then drill down into the details just for that particular month. 
To turn this off, just click on the button again and you have turned off drill down mode. To drill back up, you can go ahead and click on your drill up button and here we are back at our year data. If you haven't done so already, what we want to do is create a visual that allows us to drill down into data. In order to do that, you're going to need to create a hierarchy or two fields in one well. Two fields in one of your categorical wells is what you'll need, and so I recommend Axis. You'll want to put something in your values. In this particular report, or this page of the report, we're referring to total profit, so this is how you'll want to design your visual here. We're going to choose a regular clustered column chart. We're going to layer year and month in the Axis well, and then we're also going to layer total profit in the value well. I recommend playing with these drill down features and with this drill down feature as well. Go ahead and give that a shot and come on back. And now it's time for our lab. In this lab, you're gonna create at least two report pages. You'll need at least two report pages because the next example we're gonna go into after this lab is gonna require a bunch of visuals for us to pull together and put into a dashboard. Of the following four suggestions, you can choose any two or you could create a suggestion of your own. The idea is just to make at least two different report pages that analyze some kind of segment of your data. In the classes that we have, the in-person classes that we have, we allot about 45 minutes to working on this lab. So you can expect to spend about 45 minutes working on yours. All right, good luck. See you on the other side. Now that we've created this really good looking report here with a couple of different pages of analysis that we want to share with our coworkers, we are introduced with the challenge of actually sharing it. Um, because of the age old way that we've been operating with in Excel, most people, you know, make the presumption that we are supposed to send this file to somebody. However, this file is really big. So that's going to be a really big problem there, right there. And then the second problem that we're going to have is that not a whole lot of our end users or our consumers or our decision makers are going to have Power BI. Furthermore, how are they going to figure out how to use Power BI? If they have to open up the entire program and view this, they may feel very intimidated by this information and by the entire interface altogether. So that is going to put a damper on all of this great analysis that you've created. So instead of sharing files like we have done for a very long time, what we're going to do is we're going to publish this to a location online. And then we can send the link or just share the dashboard with anybody we choose. So we're going to start by saving our file first. Make sure that you've saved it already. And then you're going to go ahead and click on the publish button on the home tab all the way on the right hand side. If you haven't already signed in, you'll be prompted to sign in. You'll also be prompted to sign in if you haven't signed in for a while. I have not signed in for a while, so I'm going to go ahead and sign in again. Once you've done that, it's going to ask you whether you would like to publish this to your workspace or to a group workspace that you may have on Office Online. I'm going to choose to publish it to my workspace and click on Select. Now, I've done this example quite a few times before, and so I already have something called data model that's up in there. This is a good learning experience right here, because in the future, if you want to make any changes to a dashboard or to a set of reports that you have online, what you'll need to do is republish this report. In this case, I'm actually completely replacing it. Um, in both cases, you'll click on replace, and then it will publish to Power BI Online. You may want to give this a couple minutes, sit back, relax, go get a cup of coffee, whatever you need to do, and come on back, because sometimes this takes a little while. When our report here has been published to Power BI Online, we'll get a success message here telling us that, yay, yes, it has been published online, and then we'll get a couple links here. We can either open the data model in Power BI Online, or we could get quick insights. We're going to open data model in Power BI Online because we want to open it up, take a look at it, and build a dashboard. If you haven't signed into your online portal recently, you may also be prompted by your browser to sign in. All right, and welcome to Power BI Online. Let's just make a couple of observations about the interface first. On the upper left hand side, you'll see your Office Online waffle up there. In that waffle, if you have never signed into Power BI Online before, you might not see Power BI 
online, you'll see it right here. I have it right there. You might not see it quite yet if this is the first time that you've logged in there. You'll need to log in that very first time and then it'll take a little while for it to register with Microsoft. Right underneath your waffle, we have what we refer to as the hamburger, the three lines here. If you click on this, it will open up this pane on the left-hand side, and you'll be able to see all the different kinds of dashboards that you have here and all the different kinds of reports. If you continue scrolling down, you'll also see some data sets here as well. Here I have a data model, which is linked to data model here. Um, and that happens to be the report that I'm looking at. And there are the couple of tabs that we made for this particular report. It's looking good. If you want to be able to edit data in Power BI Online, you have a button right up here that says Edit Report. This will actually allow you to enter editing mode. Without clicking on this, you really can't do um, any editing, but you can still slice through your report like normal. If I open up this panel on the right-hand side, I'll be able to see uh, some filters here, but mostly you'll be able to see all of your normal editing panes once you actually click on Edit Report. I'm gonna go ahead and click on it so we can see what it looks like. Now we are in editing mode, and now I'll see the normal visualization pane and the fields pane over here on the right-hand side. I'll also see that I have the ability to put in text boxes and shapes in here. I can also edit visual interactions, which is something we're gonna be talking about in day four. I can try to refresh this data. Your refresh rate will be different rates depending on whether you have Power BI or uh, Power BI Pro. You can also duplicate this page, save it, and you can pin an entire live page. I'm gonna go ahead and save it. And I'm gonna click on reading view to get back into the initial view that we first looked at. So let's talk about what you can do with this report. You obviously can edit it because we just saw that in action, but let's say I wanna be able to create a dashboard for this. Let's say on my dashboard, I wanna have some of the most important visuals that are on here. The best kinds of things to pin to a dashboard are items that are going to be very obvious to someone that it points them in the direction of this entire analysis. So this particular page is about returns or uh, refunds here. Um, so we might take something uh, about the total sales returned, the total transactions returned, those would be good things. Also, uh, this card visual that says total returns right there, that would probably be a great indicator to somebody of the kind of data that's on here. Um, and then we have some information about returns over time and returns by our most uh, popular product categories. Um, it doesn't matter too much right now in this learning experience which ones you choose. Just make sure that you uh, can hover over one of your visuals at least and go ahead and click on this little pin icon that shows up when you hover over the visual. Let's go ahead and click on this for at least one visual. When you click on this for the very first visual, it will ask you if you wanna pin it to a dashboard. If you have existing dashboards already, it'll suggest some for you. But if you don't have any, you'll wanna click on new dashboard and we'll create a uh, example here. So my analysis is about profit and returns. So I'm gonna call this uh, profit and returns. And I'll go ahead and click on pin. Simply by generating that new dashboard while I was pinning it, I now have a new dashboard called Profit and Returns. And you'll see that that little yellow asterisk is showing up right next to it to indicate that it's a new dashboard that I have there. All right, so I got that item. Let's just pin a couple more things and then we'll go actually go over to the dashboard view and look at it. I just clicked on another visual there and now it's asking if I wanna pin it to a dashboard. Yes, an existing dashboard. Uh, and I'll choose Profit and Returns from the dropdown list and click on pin. And I'm gonna do this for a few different visuals. In the real world, it's not necessary to do it for every visual on your page, but in this case, why not? And you'll notice that some items cannot be pinned, uh, such as slicers. Slicers cannot be pinned onto your dashboard. All right, let's go to our other rep uh, page, your other report page, and uh, pin some visuals from this page as well. If you haven't done so, now's a great time to pause the video and make sure that you have pinned at least a few visuals onto a dashboard.
And when you're done, let's go take a look at that dashboard. Under your list of dashboards, find the dashboard that you just created and go ahead and click on it. So here you'll see uh, previews of all of the visuals that you chose to pin to your dashboard here. You can't actually click on these charts and slice it. That is something that reports do. This is supposed to be a very overhead perspective and it's just supposed to tell very quick stories. If you don't like the way that certain visuals are being displayed, you can resize them. So for instance, this uh, very large pie chart, maybe I don't need it to be that big. I can move around a couple um, different pie charts here and you'll see as I'm moving around these visuals, all the other visuals do get scooted around to make room for it. When you're done redesigning your dashboard, now's a good time to click on some of the items on here. So for instance, imagine that you are an end user and you're looking at this dashboard for the very first time. And you're taking a look at some of these visualizations here. I might look at the return quantity and say, oh, that's a problem. Our computer accessories get returned a lot. Hmm, I would like more information about that. By simply clicking on that visual, you'll see that I am sent straight to the report that discusses this. Now that I'm on the report, I can do all the slicing and dicing that I might want to be able to do. If you haven't noticed this already, take a note that you can also click on the visuals as well. And by simply clicking on a visual, it will slice the rest of the visuals on the page as well. This is a default design of Power BI. However, there are ways that you can custom affect this and we will talk about it in day four. To turn off the filtering that you've applied by clicking on one of those um, items, like I have computer accessories selected here, just click on the exact same line again and it will remove that filter. Now that we have this great dashboard up online, we wanna be able to share it with other people. We want them to be able to see this dashboard and use the data presented within it. On the upper right hand side, you'll see a button that says share. Now you're only gonna see this if you've actually selected on your dashboard on the left hand side. You won't see this option if you are just selected on a report. So make sure to click on your dashboard and then go ahead and click on the share icon on the upper right hand side. If you have somebody at your company that is willing to get your example uh, training documents right now, then great, go ahead and send it to them. Otherwise you don't actually have to send this to one of your coworkers. That's not required by the class. I do have an example here. The co-creator of this class with me is uh, one of the long-standing instructors of Learn It named Tom Vorvis. So I'm gonna go ahead and share it with Tom so he can see how great our dashboard looks. I can put an optional message in here so I can tell him, uh, check out this great dashboard. Or you can also in here put explicit instructions that explain to somebody how they're supposed to use this thing. When you send this to them, it is gonna send them an email notification. When they get that email notification, they can click on a link there and it will take them to the dashboard. They will need to enable their Power BI feature, but it should be included with their account. If you have it, then likelihoods are that other people at your company have at least the free version of Power BI. Something else to notice here is that people have the ability to share your dashboard with other people unless you choose to opt out of this. So just think about it really quick before you send it to somebody else. You wanna make sure that it's only shared with the people that you are aware of, or if you're okay with anybody getting it, then go ahead and click this box as well. I'm gonna go ahead and click share. Now Tom has gotten an email that says, uh, Chelsea has shared a dashboard with you and go ahead and click here to see it. If at any point in the future I change my mind and I decide this Tom guy is a troublemaker and I don't want him to have my dashboard, I can simply click on share and go to the access tab here and then I'll see that um, Tom is one of the people that I've shared it with and he right now can view it. I can click on the ellipsis here and say that I want to stop sharing or I can disable the reshares. So I can disable his ability to share it to more people, or I could just stop sharing entirely. 
I also have a dashboard link here that I can send to somebody. So I could just go ahead and send this URL to somebody. And then so long as they have Power BI within their Office Online uh, package, they will be able to see the dashboard online. Now, in some cases, you will want to send some of this data to somebody who doesn't actually have Power BI, and they also don't have Office Online. In that case, your options are limited. But it's good to know that on the left-hand side, you can select one of your reports, like the one that we've just created. That one's called Data Model. And after I've selected that, I can go to the File drop-down menu. Notice that there are options to publish to the web, which is going to give me a code that I can uh, place into any web page. I can also choose to embed it in uh, SharePoint Online. So if I have SharePoint Online, I can go ahead and put it into SharePoint Online. Notice that that is a preview feature. Um, so there might be a couple little issues with it still, but uh, it's, a, it's a great feature. I've tried it out already. It works great. Uh, you can also export to PowerPoint um, so that you can uh, put this in a PowerPoint presentation and you can download it as a PBIX copy. So imagine that somebody else sends a dashboard to you and now you have the report. You also have the option to download it elsewhere. If I need to go and edit this on another computer and I want to be able to edit it in Power BI desktop, then I'm going to go ahead and download this on another computer this way. So these are the other options that I have when it comes to sharing. Possibly one of the coolest features that we have in your Power BI dashboard is the ability to ask a question of our data. This is what we call the Q&A. So this Q&A feature allows you to type a question in relatively natural language and you can get an answer. So for instance, maybe I want to know what um, each state, we'll look at the different states and we want to know um, the total profit. So I could actually type this like what is the total profit of each state? All right, there we go. Look at that, that's pretty cool. Now you'll notice up here that the terms that are actually being recognized are underlined in yellow. We're gonna talk later on about how you can intentionally design for the Q&A feature to work a little bit better, but this is pretty good so far. Maybe I wanna know uh, what products uh, had the highest total sales. And maybe we'll um, specify product names here. There we go. Look at that. Uh, Prosware Projector. Looks like our projector was uh, one of the best-selling products there. That's pretty good. All right. Go ahead and give it a shot. If you want to exit out of your Q&A, you can always click here to exit out of your Q&A. And you'll get right back to your dashboard. Give it a shot. Congratulations on completing the Power BI Essentials course. Following this course is the Mastering Power BI course, and I hope to see you there. On behalf of myself, Chelsea Doman, and all of us here at LearnIt, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for watching. Don't forget we also offer live classes in office applications, professional development, and private training. Visit LearnIt.com for more details. Please remember to like and subscribe and let us know your thoughts in the comments. Thank you for choosing Learn It.